So uh, let me recall where we are. So we're on our way to proof versions of weak, strong, and the, let's call it the, the space-like singularity conjecture for, for the Einstein scalar field system under spherical symmetry. Okay? So uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So this is the system, this equation coupled uh, with the scalar field with this energy momentum tensor. Uh, so the, the scalar field then satisfies the wave equation. Okay, so under spherical symmetry, and okay, I won't repeat everything that we've sort of said over the last times, but remember always sort of spherical symmetry is an evolutionary uh, assumption. That's to say you assume it on initial data and you get that the space-time that evolves is spherically symmetric. In any case, the, the metric finally, it, it, spherically symmetric metric can be covered, as we said last time, um, globally in double null coordinates, so this is the form of the metric. And the, the Einstein uh, equations uh, coupled to the scalar field take this form, okay? So, uh, so uh, these are the equations satisfied uh, by, by the, the metric. The wave equation it takes, actually, you can write it in this form. And it's, it's, it's useful to point out, uh, again, various things. Uh, these uh, equations here are secretly the Raichaduri equation, and you notice immediately this monotonicity property. Okay. And the other thing to remember is that this quantity here, the so-called Hawking mass, okay, uh, is a very useful quantity in general in spherical symmetry. In particular, uh, it satisfies nice evolution equations, which I wrote down in their general form last time. And specialized to the system, uh, the, the evolution equations look like this. And uh, one, one thing that we showed last time, okay, given the nature of our initial data, right, is that um, this, this mass, this Hawking mass is everywhere non-negative. Okay, so we showed that, okay, if you remember. All right, so... Uh, so we ended the, the last time with a statement of this, uh, this proposition. Uh, so the, the proposition is the following. Suppose uh, I tell you the following uh, piece of information, that I have a first singularity on the center, on gamma, okay? and there is a sequence of trapped surfaces okay, that approach this. And of course, a spherically symmetric trapped surface Okay, given, so maybe I should also remind you that we also showed, given our assumptions, that we always have this inequality, the, the U derivative of R. Let me also just, because some of you might not, this might not be a completely second nature to everyone in the audience. So the D by DU derivative goes this way, D by DD that way. So the d by du derivative of r is negative. We established that last time. So a trapped surface is equivalent to the statement that the d by um, dv derivative of r is negative. Okay. So suppose I have such a sequence. Okay. Then uh, the Penrose diagram of space-time is this. That's the claim. Moreover, future null infinity is complete. Um, uh, as uh, so, r equals zero is a is a space-like boundary, okay? So there are no null components of that, and we'll review this immediately. And uh, moreover, the metric is inextendable beyond. Now, I, I put a star. This is actually a sort of a footnote. Um, so in principle, you should be able to say that you are a C0 inextendable beyond, okay? But the most general sense in which you want to say that, okay, strictly speaking, has not been actually shown. Okay, so that's another good exercise to, to try to do, to, to show the, that, that actually you are C0 inextendable. You are manifestly, I claim, a C2 inextendable. Okay? Uh, but you can say certain stronger statements already, but you know, the best statement that you might want to say is actually, okay, strictly speaking, open. So uh, 
sort of with, with that footnote uh, understood, uh, then uh, a corollary of this would be if I can show that generically this, this happens, or I have the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space, of course, then all the conjectures, weak cosmic censorship, strong cosmic censorship, space-like singularity conjecture would follow. Okay. Uh, if, if I could show that generically this holds. All right. Well, so let's, let's show this. Um, so it turns out that this, uh, so given what we already know, there are sort of three pieces of information that I'm telling you uh, in this picture. So the first piece of information is sort of the easiest to understand. So I'm telling you that if you have a first singularity, so proof, so let, I don't know, so let P, okay, be a first singularity. Not, you know, not on gamma, so not this one, okay. Uh, so, so the claim is that, in general, what do I know? Since my mother model is tame, I know that uh, the infimum of R in this rectangle is equal to zero. I know that it's, this is preceded by some rectangle completely in the space-time, and I know that the infimum of R is zero. Okay? So without loss of uh, generality, I claim that I can find the sequence of points which are in the interior of the rectangle, such that R goes to zero. Okay? At a PI, such that... So pi is the sequence drawn, r goes to zero. Okay. So now uh, uh, think about. Uh, uh, so uh, think about um, the following. Remember, this is a rectangle, okay, which is completely in the space-time except for this point. Okay. So this is a compact set. Okay, which is which is completely in the space time, the, the the lower the lower two edges. Okay, so R has an infimum on these lower two edges, which is strictly positive. Okay, so here and here, okay, R is bigger than some epsilon, which is which is bigger than zero. Happy. So what this means is that. If you go very close here, okay, so which, I don't know, let, let me do this direction because it's the, it's the non-trivial one, okay? Um, so if I go very close here, okay, R was greater than or equal to epsilon here, R is less than epsilon if I'm very close, just at, on this sequence, okay? So that means that on this null curve, <laughs> Somewhere in between, somewhere here, okay, dv of r had to become negative, okay? So dv of r had to become negative. But then what do we know from good old Raishaduri from this equation here? We know uh, that, uh, again, Remember, to, you have to, to, to reprove what we know, you have to remember the covariance of the equation. But anyway, we know that that's preserved. So to the future now of this point on this null cone, dv of r is less than zero. Okay? Which means that uh, r here, okay, is less than whatever r was there. So first of all, this, this tells us two things, okay? So the first thing this tells us is the following. So suppose there is a null boundary component here that emerges from the first singularity, okay? So uh, 
I, I claim this immediately tells us that, that R would have to be equal to zero on this boundary component. Because, you see, I have a, it's hard to draw, I have a sequence now of these, ah, I have a sequence of these um, sort of <laughs> segments for which R is going to zero. But of course, du of r is always negative. So this tells me that monotonically, r is going to 0 on all null curves that go in this direction. So that's clear. OK. But remember now, we know something else, which I, I, I advertised at the very last time. OK. So uh, this equation here, we can rewrite it as, um, let me get the sign of the factor right. Um, we can rewrite it like this. And so in view of this, this also has a sign. Okay, so, uh, so I'm telling you that, okay, asymptotically, okay, the, this R difference is zero, okay? But of course here, dv of r is strictly negative. So this r difference, OK, is, is strictly positive. I mean, this minus this is strictly positive, however you want to say that, OK? So uh, easy exercise, uh, this is now impossible, OK? Because <laughs> maybe I should say it like this. This minus this is strictly negative, OK? In the limit, this minus that has to be less than equal to this minus this. So it cannot be that asymptotically this minus this can become zero. Okay, so what we've just shown is there can be no, there can be no null po component coming out like that. Okay? So the, there does not exist R equals zero. Okay, so the, 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 the same argument allows you to, to say that, well, first on, on an Ingoing null component, r is equal to zero. In fact, this is sort of easier because du of r is always less than zero. Okay? And then that same inequality okay, allows you to say that, uh, well, this is actually impossible. Okay. Uh, but note that we, 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 we really, to, to, show, okay, to show that you know, r has to vanish here and there if there are such null components, uh, that's, that's actually quite general. We only really used Raishaduri. Okay, but to show that the components are absent, we, we use this extra monotonicity, which is special to the Einstein scalar field system. Okay. All right. That's great. Um, so uh, the second piece of information that I'm telling you in, in this proposition is that, uh, so what, what I'm telling you is that so, so, okay, let's, let's, you know, so where are we, maybe, I should say, that's to say, what, what is the most general picture that we could have, okay? So, of course, under our assumption, I, I, I know that the, the past, the future null infinity has non-empty uh, complement because I have at least one trapped surface. I already know that this is complete by what I told you last time. Uh, I just told you that the sort of first singularities, okay, form a, a, a space-like boundary. There are no null components emanating from first singularities, okay? But you can still have null pieces here, and you can still have a null piece there. Okay? Of which, so far, I, I, I've told you nothing, okay? So let, let's, let's look near here. So suppose, suppose you, know, you, you have a null piece here. Is this possible? OK. So let's just think about it a little bit. So suppose you have a null piece of the boundary here, which is, in general, allowed by what, what we've proven so far. OK. Uh, and here we're going to use the assumption, okay. namely that we have this sequence. Okay, so this is a sequence of uh, trapped surfaces, 
So dv of r is less than 0 on this sequence, and this sequence converges there. OK. So uh, claim, by the way, uh, with, without loss of generality, I can put the sequence here. So if the sequence was there, little exercise using Raishaduri, uh, construct the sequence, which is on, on this side of that, and I'll call that will be more useful for you. OK? All right, so what did we say? So first of all, what, what is the R value? OK, what is the R value of these uh, trapped surfaces? I claim to you that R goes to 0 as you go along this sequence. Now, you might think that's obvious, because R is 0 here. OK, but of course, no one tells you that R extends in any way continuous to this a priori. OK, so why, <laughs> why does R go to 0? Uh, and here we, we, we can use our, our, our good friend, um, um, okay, right. <laughs> so I, I, I want us to use our good uh, friend monotonicity, but actually, okay, I sort of, um, it's a two-step process. So, okay, let's do the two steps. So first of all, um, if this is the case, okay, you can first go, sort of to the past, OK, along these, all right, such that uh, you reach the, the, you know. <laughs> so you see, OK, this is a trapped surface, but, uh, you know, this is an open condition. So there are trapped surfaces earlier, OK? So there are trapped surfaces earlier. So I want to find the. Uh, a marginally trapped surface, so a surface where dv of r is equal to 0, and with a property that uh, if, if then I go earlier, uh, dv of r is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll draw a slightly bigger picture to make this clear. So the claim is the following. At the center, okay, r is, e r is equal to 0, and remember, r is greater than 0 everywhere in the bulk. So certainly, as you come off the center, dv of r is greater than 0. Okay? So if I know that, let's say, on this null curve, there is a trapped surface, okay, then there is a first surface where dv r is equal to 0. Okay? So let me, let me look first at, at these, surf, these surfaces. And now I should, I guess, say that okay, this sequence, you don't know if it's on this side or on that side. Okay? So it could oscillate. It doesn't matter. So this is a sequence such that dv of r is equal to 0, OK? OK? All right. I don't like this picture. <laughs> so I, I claim that uh, actually, OK, uh, I, 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 I can say something better than this. Namely, I, I can say that uh, this had to be the picture. So why, 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 did, uh, why did this uh, sequence, again, have to be sort of on this side? Well, it's again, this relation here, OK? So if, 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 if you are the first, so if, if you have the property that uh, du, I'm sorry, dv of r, uh, is less than or equal to 0 here, OK? Then, well, certainly that has to be true, you know, from then on by this. And in fact, you get, you get a, a contradiction in view of the fact that I told you that on gamma, all right? So actually, uh, uh, this sequence is, is again here, OK? And uh, it, it looks like this, OK? That's to say, if I, if I look at a, a, a later thing in the sequence and I go backwards, OK, then dv of r is, is, is greater than 0, OK? All right. So now, finally, uh, uh, I, can, I can tell you that on this sequence, r goes to 0, from which it will follow that on my initial sequence of trapped surfaces, r goes to 0. Because, of course, no. if this is the first marginally trapped surface, then dv of r is less than or equal to 0 here. And so r here is even less than r there. OK. okay. 
So to recap, I know that sort of the sequence of, I have a sequence of you know, first marginally trapped surfaces, first in, in the sense I said, okay? Uh, <laughs> such that dv of, uh, of r equals zero. And I want to show that, so I want that r goes to zero. So I, I claim that this is, this is clear uh, simply from, from, from the following statement, okay? So let's look at this R difference, okay? And uh, compare it to this R difference. So over here, right, dV of R is greater than or equal to zero from here to here. Okay? On the other hand, du dv of r is less than or equal to zero. So that tells you that this r difference, okay, is, is less than or equal to this r difference. Okay? All right, but now if you think about the, the geometry of this, this point is, okay, so now I drew something where that's too big, okay? So this point is converging there. So if, if I draw these rectangles, okay, for later, later points, they look like this. All right? So this R difference is always less than or equal to that R difference. But that R difference goes to zero because the, the dimension of the rectangle here is going to zero and the data here is, is regular. Okay, so that's actually immediate from this nice one to this. Okay, so uh, to recap uh, uh, what I've just shown you is that on this sequence of trapped surfaces, okay, which again are on, on this side of that backwards null cone coming from this point, R is going to zero. Okay. Well now, okay, I claim that immediately I know that if there is a null piece coming out from there, um, R better be zero identically here. Okay. Well, why is that the case? Well, again, uh, I know that R here is very small, right? And if I go on the outgoing null cone coming from there, dv of r is less than zero, so r is even smaller than what it is here, okay? So I have now these, these, these null curves, okay? And on this whole null curve, okay, r is smaller than something, which is tending to zero as I, I, I put the point there. Okay. Other hand, again, uh, r is monotonically decreasing in this direction, so indeed r has to be zero. But now the exact same argument that we used to say that you could not have these null segments tells you that, um, so in fact, you know, <laughs> this is a contradiction. Okay, again, you're, you're, you're contradicting always this. Okay, so that's great. Um, so, uh, so finally, what this is telling you is that if I have this sequence, then the r equals zero, um, you know, I, I have to have a, a uh, a curve of first singularities that goes into this point. Okay, so the last issue, and this is in some sense the one that we actually have to use some more information uh, that I haven't told you yet, is how do I know that I do not have a null piece coming from there? And this will be interesting exactly because uh, this property uh, is, um, is the property that won't be, won't be true in, 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 in greater generality. Okay. So, okay. So what, what can I say here? So here's the point. So remember I've already told you a few th extra things about what happens uh, in this uh, uh, situation. Um, so let's, let's sort of... So, assume for sake of contradiction, okay, that near this point, okay, the, the Penrose diagram looks like this. Okay. 
So what have I already told you? I've already told you, yes. Say again, sorry. The, the sequence of first singularities is somewhere over there. It's, I haven't depicted it. So, um, so the, claim, the claim is the following, that the, the existence of the sequence, okay, it's just telling me, I'm just using it here. So for, for this part, if you want, all I need, you know, all I am uh, using is the existence of one trapped surface, just one, because that's what's telling me that the future of null infinity indeed has a non-trivial, its past has a non-trivial complement. Okay? So I now want to look at near this point and exclude this possibility. This one? This one. Oh. Uh, yeah, I don't know what. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what this was supposed to be. I don't. Nothing. <laughs> this was the sequence. There's no, there's no claim that this sequence has anything to do with this point. Okay? In fact, I'm not really, I'm, you know, I. Basically, you should think of what I'm going to tell you now. It's a completely, quote, local statement near this point. I'm going to say, you know, you cannot have this Penrose diagram near this point. So let's, 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 let's do this. So what, what other information do I know? Well, I know this Penrose inequality. That's to say, I know that r uh, goes to some r plus along here, which is less than infinity. OK? Um, all right, let, let's see what I can get just, uh, just uh, from uh, knowing that. Um, so I claim to you that, uh, uh, so this is sort of a, uh, a, a funny little exercise. Uh, so I claim to you that you can, um, you can already show the following. So of course, uh, all right, so I, I can talk about the limit of R on this boundary, where by limit, I just mean the limit in this direction. So why, why can I talk about that? Remember, um, R is almost monotonic in this direction. It, it can change, its derivative can change sign exactly once, okay? Which means that eventually, it is monotonic, okay? So I can certainly talk about the, you know, the limit, okay, of R here, okay? So I can talk about R there. So let me affirm the following statement that actually R, whatever it is, okay, has to uh, tend to R plus as you go this way. So this is sort of a, a you know, a nice little exercise. Um, so uh, suppose it doesn't, okay? Well, it certainly cannot tend to uh, something bigger than R plus. I claim that you can easily see contradicts the, the fact that du of R is less than zero. That's an easy, that's a very easy uh, argument, okay? Um, but, uh, but actually, if, if R were to tend to something uh, less than R plus, strictly less than R plus, so suppose R tended to R plus, um, uh, 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 minus epsilon, sorry, okay? Then uh, you could find a sequence of points like this, okay? Where, I don't know, r equals r plus uh, minus epsilon over two, and r equals uh, R plus minus, I don't know. Maybe, let me make this, uh, uh, yeah, minus, uh, <laughs> I need a number, uh, uh, epsilon over four, that's fine. Okay? You like that? Um, so, so in particular, so that's a, that's sort of a, a, a 
uh, an easy exercise. And the sequence of points have the, I claim you can choose them, okay? So that, uh, you know, this point is lying on, you know, this, sorry, whatever. This point is lying on this null curve, coming backwards null curve coming from there, okay? And now, you know, you can sort of throw away a bunch of these points, so you can always wait in the sequence such that, you know, <laughs> the next one of these points has a lower u value than, the, than this point, okay? So you can find the sequence of points of, if you want, intervals like this, okay? And these intervals go there. All right, uh, this is my favorite way of saying this, just because. So what is the um, R difference here? The R difference is epsilon over four, right? Okay? But now I want to use this relation, but I'm going to use it in the other direction. Using, okay. A trivial fact analysis. Uh, so what this is telling you is that if you go at a later time, I, I just don't have so much, then the, the R difference is at least the sum of these. But there are infinitely many. Okay, so that you'd get an infinite R difference, which is a contradiction. So uh, I let you think about this picture, but the, the claim is that, okay, this is immediately contradicted by, by, by this monotonicity, okay? All right, so, so you actually have this. All right, so that's great, but okay, that, that we haven't yet, um, disproved anything. So um, you could have this, right? So I have to tell you some more information, uh, which, is, which is actually uh, uh, more difficult to show, but, but you can show it. Um, so it turns out that you know, by really using now the wave equation and sort of its decay properties in the exterior, okay, one can show two things about the exterior that will be important. So the first thing is that the, the event horizon is complete. Okay? I've never yet told you that the event horizon is complete. I've told you that null infinity is complete, but I've never told you that the event horizon is complete. And what that just means is that this on the event horizon, let's call the event horizon u equals u naught, is equal to infinity. So fact. Again, this fact depends on, on, on the analysis of waves in black hole exteriors, something that's been a, okay, a subject of much research for, for, for some time. Okay, so this is one thing. Okay. But I'll give you another fact. Okay. So fact two is that if I look at the integral of dv phi, in absolute value along the event horizon dv, okay? This is finite. Now, uh, can you see this statement? Maybe you can't. Let me write it again here. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit funny. Um, What's nice, so this is some norm, this is some uh, sort of, uh, this is a statement of decay for phi, you know, well, along the event horizon. And I claim this statement is uh, invariant to the normalization of null coordinates, okay? So uh, if I rescale the, the coordinate v because I'm taking dv here, okay, this is actually, uh, in, you know, so this is an invariant quantity. So, um, okay. Uh, so let me tell you one third fact, okay? So these are, if you want, difficult facts. But the third fact is actually immediate from the, the sort of monotonicity properties of M, okay? Because, because I know that there is at least one trapped surface, okay? Then I know that uh, M is strictly positive near 
here. In fact, I know that uh, m is greater than some epsilon naught. in some region like this. And the reason you know that is that on a, a trapped surface, okay, 2m has to be bigger than r, okay? And then you can follow the, the monotonicity of m like this, okay? So I know that there's at least one trapped surface. That's all I need to be able to give you that. Okay. So, all right. Well, uh, so how can we argue from, from, from this point on? Okay. So, um, so because I don't want to spend uh, infinite time on this, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the various statements as exercises, but they're, they're quite easy to do. I'll, I'll say it in words, and you can try to uh, fill in the, the details. So the first thing you immediately uh, notice is the following. I can look at that shaded region, that, that purported characteristic rectangle that supposedly exists here. Okay? Look at the shaded region. Okay? Um, I can integrate this equation twice okay? because of the finiteness of R. Okay? The, the left-hand side of this is bounded. It's just the R difference of two endpoints. Of, of the of the endpoints of the of, of of the rectangle, so it's bounded, whatever it is. R itself is bounded below, away from zero. Okay. M is finite. Okay. R is bounded above. Maybe that's more pertinent by R plus in that region. Again, by the du R less than zero monotonicity. So it follows that the double integral of omega squared is, is finite. Okay? So the, 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 and similarly, if you want, the double integral of r squared omega squared is finite because r is bounded. So that's actually the space-time volume. Okay? So um, just a remark. So if I'm in the situation, then the space-time volume of this is, is bounded. Okay. So, uh, so now let's look at... Uh, um, uh, so now let's look at uh, this equation here. Okay, and uh, let's um, let's integrate it twice. So um, okay, I, I it's maybe most convenient to at this point choose a particular uh, normalization of the v coordinate. Okay, so I'm going to use you don't this is not necessary, but it's sort of it makes me feel better. I'm going to use a normalization of the v-coordinate such that omega squared is equal to 1 on the event horizon. And of course, because I just told you that the integral of omega squared is, is infinite, that means that this will not be a bounded v-coordinate. But nonetheless, I will, you know, I'll draw it like this. Okay, so this is the event horizon. Okay, and of course, this will now be v equals infinity. Okay? And uh, omega squared is equal to 1 here, okay? And you, know, again, imagine I'm, I have this sort of rectangle. I can translate the coordinates so that the edge of the rectangle is, let's say, v equals 0. It doesn't matter. Okay. So let me, let me try to integrate the equation star, okay, in this region. Okay? So... Um, so here's the point. Uh, I, I, I'm also going to really consider a very, very small region, okay? So that whatever omega is here, it's very near one. In fact, if you want, for convenience, let me rescale the u coordinate here such that omega squared is equal to one. Okay? So if 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 I integrate this equation twice, as far as the left hand side is concerned. I have no initial data terms because the log of omega is initially 1. Okay? So I'm just going to get you know, the log of omega, let's say, here, and some double integral here. So what's the double integral? It's the, it's the double integral of this, of this, and of this. Okay? 
So I just told you that this double integral is, is, is bounded. It's, it's, it's finite, OK? It's something. So it's uniformly bounded, no matter which point I take. So what about this double integral? I claim that it's, it's also bounded. Maybe the easiest way of uh, seeing that is putting this term here on the left-hand side and integrating this again twice over u and v. So you, you get then that this double integral is bounded. And OK, they only differ by the different weights of r, but r is bounded above and below. So the last thing that you have to uh, understand is this double integral this double integral. And it's a very nice uh, exercise, uh, I think. Uh, it's, it's not a difficult exercise to show the following. So given this assumption here, okay, I know that if I put my v equals 0 okay, very, very late, all right, then the, the integral of dv of v, okay, it's finite. In fact, I can even make it small initially okay, by choosing this time to be very late. And again, by choosing this sort of rectangle to be very short, I can certainly just by regularity ensure that this integral, the integral of du phi in norm, is less than epsilon. So, uh, so then you look at the wave equation. This is the wave equation. And I've written it in this form. And when you write it in this form, it's very nice because uh, you don't see omega at all. You just see r. So, uh, so somehow, uh, here is my uh, exercise for you, integrating in a smart way the wave equation, using the fact that the r difference in this rectangle, so what I'll call, you know, r minus r, r of x minus r of y, for any two points, okay, is less than epsilon if I make the rectangle small enough. Okay? You can show that um, this double integral is also bounded. And now I claim this is a contradiction, because what you've shown is you've shown that um, uh, log of omega in absolute value is uniformly bounded in this whole region everywhere. But that means that omega is like 1. If log of omega is uniformly bounded, it means omega is like 1. It's bounded away from 0. Which means that the integral of omega squared is like the integral of 1 du dv. But the range of the v coordinate is infinite. So it's a contradiction. OK. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, the proof of, of that. Uh, exercise, fill in the details, or maybe find a, a simpler argument. OK? All right. So, so now uh, so we've, we've completed uh, this uh, proposition. So now let me tell you the actual uh, meat of uh, Christodoulou's um, work for this model, which is precisely the statement that, uh, generically, we are in the domain of that proposition. OK, so this is the theorem. Actually, it's good that there's some <laughs> musical accompaniment. All right. So, uh, so the statement is for generic initial data, and I'll get back to this uh, in just a second. Um, then, uh, if uh, there exists a, a first singularity on the center. So remember, if there does not exist a first singularity uh, in the center, by what we said previously, the Penrose diagram is that of Minkowski space. And again, everything is true. Okay, so, you know, so if there exists a first singularity in the center, um, 
then it's accompanied by such a sequence. Then there exists a sequence. OK? So there exists sequence of trapped surfaces. as in the proposition. OK, so uh, corollary. So weak cosmic censorship, strong cosmic censorship. Well, OK, certainly the C2 version, but as I said, that's not the right version. In principle, the C0 version, OK? Maybe it, it's, it's relatively easy to show you know, a slightly weaker notion of the C0 version, namely you cannot extend C0 as a spherically symmetric spacetime. But in any case, I, I just put the asterisk that, okay, there's a nice little exercise to complete here. Um, and the space-like singularity conjecture, true for Einstein's scalar field in, spherically, in spherical symmetry. Okay. So that, that's, that's his theorem. OK, so let me just discuss a little bit uh, the proof, because somehow the proof is much more subtle than uh, anything we've done on the board so far. And so I really can't give it justice, but I can tell you the mechanism, okay? which is very pretty and relatively easy to describe. So, uh, so here is the mechanism. So the first, if you want, thing that he shows is the following. If you have this first singularity on the center, okay, then something has to go wrong at this first singularity. All right, but what has to go wrong? Remember, we got a lot of mileage you know, for first singularities outside of the center saying that R had to go to zero. In fact, we've been using this all the time. Of course, here, that R goes to zero, you know it because you're on the center, and so R, R is zero here, right? Okay. So how can you characterize what goes wrong here? So first of all, he, he is able to show the following, that uh, two M over R, okay? So this is, in some sense, a, a dimensionless quantity. Um, this has to be bigger than some uh, sort of universal constant in this model, which is uh, strictly positive. Okay? So the, the limit, and let me not say precisely what I mean by the, the, the you know, in what sense the, the limit, but sort of, I mean, particular there has to be a sequence of points such that this quantity here, okay, is strictly positive in the limit, in fact, bigger than some particular constant that you can actually compute. So this is uh, sort of claim one. And this is already actually quite difficult uh, to prove. Okay? It would be very nice to have sort of uh, analogous, statement, analogous statements for other uh, Mather models. Okay? There really is not anything available like this. Okay. So that's the first statement. So now I'm going to rewrite this equation here in yet another way. I'm going to write it, okay? So, sort of looking at this expression, okay? And uh, uh, recalling the definition of M, okay? I can rewrite this expression. Let me write it correctly. Um, with the right sign, I'll get the sign wrong. I'll get the, no, 2M over R, okay? Okay? Happy? So all I've done, you can see it from this, from this form here, okay? All I've done is I've solved this equation for omega squared and plugged it in there. Okay? So again, I'm going to, uh, um, so what, 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 what am I going to do now? I'm going to think of this as an evolution equation for dv of r 
on the backwards null cone, okay, emanating from this first singularity. Okay? So this equation is telling me du dvr is equal to something, and I think of it as an evolution equation for this. Okay? And I, I try to integrate this equation as a linear equation in dv of r. Okay, so, so here's the point. Because I know that this is true in the limit, okay, I can rewrite this as 1 over r times something bounded below, away from 0. Okay. And then uh, this, if, if you want, uh, without loss of, I mean, by the argument that we already saw, actually, I know that this is greater than, I mean, this, this, um, uh, expression here is uh, less than one. Okay, so this this is a factor that only makes things bigger. Okay, and I can integrate this dur. So what does that tell you? It tells you the following: uh, since r is going to zero, okay, this the integral of this diverges. So that's telling you that uh, the, uh, the quantity uh, um, dvr, okay, is becoming zero because you have to also remember the sign. Okay, so dvr is becoming zero, okay, as you go over there. So um, what does this mean? So I, I claim that this is a blue shift effect. Okay. Because this means that if you have two observers, okay, here and here, and the observer normalizes their time to r, which is the only canonical thing to do, okay, then uh, the, the observer here will see radiation coming from here as infinitely bl blue shifted. Okay, so that's something you can think about very easily. Now, in this model, you have radiation sitting around because you have phi. Okay? And what you want to show now is that generically, that blue shift tends uh, to concentrate energy uh, between, where is a good picture, between here and any close enough point like this so as uh, to make this trapped. So that's basically uh, what, what, what he shows. In fact, what he shows is that if you happen to have a solution such that there were no trapped surfaces that went there, okay, then by adding arbitrarily small perturbation in some sense, which lives here, okay, then this blue shift effect forces the existence of those trapped surfaces. So that's uh, essentially what he shows. Now, one interesting thing about the argument is that um, in order to exploit this, it's very useful to allow the initial data to be slightly irregular. That's to say, to always consider initial data okay, that are not smooth, see infinity, but slightly irregular. Slightly irregular, but still in the class of a well-posed theory. Okay? So uh, part of the difficulty is identifying you know, such a class that gives you the flexibility to be able to carry out this argument. So, you know, he also sort of discovered Okay? So, class refers to the, the function space defining the initial data. And the second uh, interesting thing uh, to point out in this context is the genericity is necessary. And, um, so this is necessary. I want to stress this was not uh, uh, thought to be the case uh, before. I already mentioned that in the context of the dust model, uh, weak cosmic censorship is, is actually violated generically within the context of spherical symmetry. But in that case, it, it really is because of a failure of the model. Um, 
uh, the Einstein scalar field uh, system is as good as it gets as far as models are concerned. The Mather equation is completely linear, so there's nothing wrong about the Mather. The Mather certainly does not form singularities on its own accord. Um, so the original hope was that there would never be naked singularities in this model. And so in, in parallel with this proof, he actually constructed um, examples where the, 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 the Penrose diagram looks like this uh, or, or like this. Okay? So there, there are examples, okay? spherically symmetric examples that look like this, but they, they are not generic. So the, the theorem tells you that they are not generic, so in particular, you know, these examples, were you to perturb them, you, you, know, you would have the, the, the Penrose diagram that is drawn over there. Okay. So that's, um, that's um, Christodoulou's work. So this is great. I have 20 minutes. And in, in 20 minutes, I will give a, an abridged version of lecture four. But in some sense, I think that's the, exactly the, 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 um, the uh, amount of time um, that we need for it. Okay. Uh, so let me write here, maybe. I warned you at the beginning, of course, that uh, I'm not going to <laughs> keep to my schedule. OK. So lecture four the C0 stability of the Kerr Chi horizon. without symmetry. Without symmetry. OK. So, so before I say anything about Kerr, OK, let me say something far more elementary, OK? Um, let me say something about Reisner Nordstrom, OK? So uh, we've already, I've already drawn um, in a previous lecture, the Penrose diagram of uh, Reiser Nordstrom solution. So let me draw it again. So remember, Reiser Nordstrom is a solution of the Einstein Maxwell uh, uh, equation. So uh, T mean E is, okay. So exercise, adorn this with indices so that that is the um, uh, correct energy momentum tensor for, for a Maxwell field, okay? And then the Maxwell equations, of course, are just that uh, without any mother, uh, which is charged, are, are just this, right? Okay, anyway. So, um, so Reiser Nordstrom is a spherically symmetric uh, solution of, 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 of that, OK? Uh, it has two ends, and it's, it's Penrose diagram, as defined uh, in, in the sort of notations of this uh, course. It looks like this, OK? And this boundary is actually completely regular, so I can I can extend um, I can extend the the solution here smoothly extends, and of course any such extension is manifestly non-unique. Okay, so um, so let's just focus on. Um, this rectangle, let's just focus on this rectangle, OK? So uh, if, I, if I focus on this rectangle, then OK, the, the global aspects, the fact that I have two ends, et cetera, it's really irrelevant, OK? What is going on in this rectangle that's different from before? Because 
before I gave you an argument in the Einstein scalar field model that you could not have this behavior. So what's the difference? Well, okay, I'm going to, okay, sorry, but I'll, um, <laughs> we like um, graffiti a lot in, in, in Greece, so I'm going to do some graffiti. So, um, so let's, let's understand the, the, the um, extra terms that you would have in, in the Maxwell case. So I claim that actually, even though this is a lot of equations to write down, um, in, in spherical symmetry, the Maxwell part is not dynamic. So it just gives you a, a constant times something depending on the metric, which appears in the equations. So we call that constant Q squared. So I have an extra term here, which looks like this. All right. And I have an extra term here also that looks like this. Okay, so if you want to forget about the scalar field, there's no scalar field now. Okay, bye-bye scalar field, but you have Q. These are the equations that Reisner Nordstrom satisfies. So actually, exercise, uh, understand completely the Penrose diagram of Reisner Nordstrom just from the equations without writing down the metric explicitly. It's actually a, a, an illuminating exercise. So in particular, I claim to you that the reason that this can now happen, okay, is because of, of um, this term, okay, here and there. So in particular, we, we, you lose the very nice monotonicity that du dv has a, uh, you know, has a, has a sign, okay? And if you look at uh, um, um, the, the uh, equation here, Okay, um, then uh, <laughs> it turns out that inside the black hole, near the Cauchy horizon, this term here dominates over that term. Okay, and it's this term here, let's say in this equation, that is driving uh, the phenomenon. Okay, so so the first thing you might ask is whether, in spherical symmetry, okay, uh, having Cauchy horizon is stable. And somehow the easiest model to look at that is the model where I just couple both the scalar field and the Maxwell, but I don't even bother to make the scalar field charged. Okay? So this is a model. It, it admits Reiser Nordstrom as, a, as an explicit solution. Okay? Unfortunately, Reiser Nordstrom is the only spherically symmetric electrovacuum solution. So, if you want dynamics in spherical symmetry, you have to add matter. So, let's just add the scalar field, but let's not even make it charged. Okay? So, this is uh, the energy momentum tensor. So, uh, you still have the wave equation, you have these equations, and uh, just that you, you still also have this, this term. Okay? So I should note that you should also, there, there's, there, there are extra terms on, on, on these equations here, but okay, these, are, these equations are deduced from these. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so a while ago, uh, I, I showed that uh, when, when you uh, consider general solutions, of these equations. By the way, in, in these equations, if you want Q to be non-zero, so if you don't want these to re reduce to Christodoulos' model, initial data has to have two ends. Okay? It has to have two ends. Uh, that's another uh, nice, uh, easy exercise. So, um, um, So in, initial data has to have two ends. And uh, another very, very easy exercise is the following. Anytime you have a tame matter model, and this model is again tame in the sense that we said, and you have two-ended initial data, okay, then weak cosmic censorship is true. 
sort of trivially, and that just has to do with the fact that there's no center for first singularities to come from. So all the first singularities have to have r equals zero, and if you think about Raichaduri, you have that statement. Okay. So in this case, you always have weak cosmic censorship. You always have complete future null infinity. And the statement uh, is the following. So if q is not equal to zero, there will always be null pieces of the boundary that come from here, which are non-empty. OK, so this is something that uh, I proved uh, a while back. It, uh, it also uses a, a study I did jointly with uh, Rodnyansky about the decay of waves in the exterior, because you really need to know rather precise information about the stability of the exterior regions here, and in particular the, the behavior of fields on the event horizon, in order to say that, that, that this is the case. So in general, uh, you may also have a, a space-like singularity here, okay? although actually, uh, strictly speaking, in, in this model, the argument that says that the r equals zero first singularities form a space-like singularity does not hold because of the failure of that monotonicity, duv r less than equal to zero. But in any case, the rest of the boundary, you can show that r, r is equal to zero. But actually, uh, what, um, what uh, I showed moreover is that if your initial data was close to Reisner or Nordstrom initial data, then uh, there will be no such piece, and these will close off the space time. Okay. And moreover, uh, what, 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 what I showed is that uh, you can still extend this uh, C0. So the metric extends. Zero. Now, um, so in particular, in this model in spherical symmetry, the, the C0 extendability, inextendability uh, formulation of strong cosmic censorship is false in this model in spherical symmetry. Okay. Now, um, even though, uh, so from the point of view of C0, this is a Cauchy horizon. This is regular. There's no, no problem whatsoever. But from the point of view of higher regularity, generically, there is a problem. And I had some partial result on that, but I couldn't quite get the full result. And actually, uh, much more recently, uh, Luke and O have, have shown that um, for generic initial data, the boundary is entirely singular. Okay, so they, they have a condition on initial data, which is a genericity condition. So for somehow, a, a, you should think, with probability one, they have a precise statement in their paper, um, then the, the, the boundary is entirely singular. And okay, they can, they can say in particular that you are C2 inextensible. And again, the proof morally suggests that you have actually a stronger statement, maybe even a statement at the level of H1 in extendability, which is a formulation of strong cosmic censorship uh, due to Stothulu. Um, but there's still a little thing to complete in order to, to be able to say that. But in any case, you have a, a weaker formulation of strong cosmic censorship is, is true in this, in this model in spherical symmetry. Now, uh, in this spherically symmetric world, there's still nice things you might want to consider. Uh, so the reason that you, you need to have two-ended data here is because um, uh, uh, the um, uh, because the, the scalar field itself is uncharged. So this Q to be non-zero has to sit on some topology. Okay. So this is the <laughs> this is the topology, right? Uh, you can, you can consider one-ended collapse in this model uh, by making, for instance, the, the scalar field charged. Uh, and that's actually, this model has been considered uh, recently by Maxime uh, van, der Mortel, van der Mortel. And uh, he's been able to show a, a, a version of the sort of stability of a piece of the Cauchy horizon. Uh, but under assumptions on the behavior at the event horizon, and actually those assumptions are, are thought to be true, 
always, but uh, <laughs> it, it's still much more difficult even in that model to uh, retrieve those assumptions from assumptions of level initial data. So even in spherical symmetry, there, there, there are nice things to do. Okay, in the last five minutes, I can state uh, uh, this result, okay, which in some sense uh, is the conclusion of, of the, the story of the C0 formulation of strong custom censorship. So uh, you might say, this is all very well, but at the end of the day, this is a spherical symmetric model. And okay, what is generic within spherical symmetry may be completely ungeneric outside the spherical symmetry because spherically, spherical symmetry itself is measure zero in the sort of, you know, it's probability zero, however you say it, in the, in for general initial dot. Okay. So, um, so is, is this really relevant uh, sort of more generally? So, um, so here's our uh, theorem with, um, with, um, uh, with, um, so I'll erase these equations now with Jonathan uh, Luke. So this is a theorem <laughs> released uh, a few years ago now on the archive. So let me let me say it as follows. So uh, so theorem. So there there are two statements maybe I'll I'll, I'll make. So I'll make in some sense what's what's uh, what's in some sense first the, the more general statement. So the more general statement is the following. So let's forget about symmetry uh, uh, completely. Since we're forgetting about symmetry, let's also forget about matter, because. In some sense, the motivation for the matter that we've been considering is exactly we had to add matter to evade Birkhoff's theorem, you know, to have non-trivial dynamics in spherical symmetry. But somehow the, the, the conceptual question of, of cosmic censorship, after all, okay, is first and foremost a, a question already about the, the vacuum equations. Okay? So uh, vacuum, but now no symmetry whatsoever. So suppose I have a black hole horizon. So suppose I have a black hole horizon, and I assume that, okay, the horizon, who knows what happens at early times, how, you know, it didn't exist, I mean, it, whatever, how it formed in the space time, however you want to say that. But suppose that at late times, it settles down to Kerr, and it settles down at the expected inverse polynomial rates that uh, it is believed that, um, uh, sort of perturbations on uh, event horizons decay okay, in sort of the, the very late time uh, regime where they're governed by tails. Okay? So let's assume that your, your, your geometry settles down on the event horizon to curve. So um, it is actually believed that uh, generic vacuum space times will uh, eventually either disperse or settle down to uh, a finite number of curves moving far away from each other. So we are now talking about, let's say, the neighborhood of one of them. Okay. So suppose this is uh, the, what you know about the event horizon. Then the statement is, so let me write, settles down to Kerr. Asymptotically. Maybe, uh, let me write here. Uh, this is sort of with Jonathan Luke. Uh, so the statement is then, then uh, well, of course, th this, is a, this is a space time without any symmetries. So I cannot define Penrose diagrams in the way I did. But, um, but actually, uh, the claim is that uh, the, the future of the event horizon and, uh, let's say, an ingoing null cone can actually be covered by double null coordinates. You are not spherically symmetric, but you are still covered with double null coordinates. So I can again draw the range of those coordinates, and 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 the the statement is that uh, the spacetime exists in a region that contains a, a, a characteristic 
rectangle in double null coordinates that looks like this. And in particular, this is a Cauchy horizon, beyond which the, the space-time is inextendable, is, I'm sorry, extendable. Zero. So uh, what, this, what this tells you is if you believe sort of the completely standard uh, picture of gravitational collapse uh, for the vacuum, then the generic spacetime either disperses or will have a piece of Cauchy horizon across which uh, the solution is extendable C0, okay? And remember, extendable C0 means, morally speaking, that uh, sort of observers, they are not destroyed. So they, they reach the Cauchy horizon without being destroyed. Uh, so uh, 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 an amplification, but also specialization of this statement is the following. So suppose in particular that you start here with initial data, which is globally near two-ended Kerr initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations without any symmetry. So it is believed, and now, okay, this is more than a belief, sort of all the ideas necessary to prove rigorously uh, the fact that uh, the exterior regions of the Kerr spacetime uh, are stable, and the, the solution will, will settle down to two nearby Kerr solutions. So this is what's sometimes called the you know, nonlinear stability of Kerr problem. Okay? So this is something that now can be shown, sort of putting together a lot of things. Uh, I mean, can be shown. It's, a, it, it's difficult to write something which is self-contained and readable, but in, in principle, this is now mostly a technical problem. Um, so in particular, in, in, in this case, you will be everywhere close to Kerr, and you will settle down inverse polynomially to two nearby Kerrs. So in this case, well, the theorem already tells you that, okay, near these event horizons from these points in the Penrose diagram, whatever this means now in this context, you'll have a little piece of Cauchy horizon. And actually, in this case, uh, you can say something more. Uh, the, the entire bifurcate Cauchy horizon of, of Kerr is stable. And you can, in fact, um, extend uh, the, the space-time across the entire bifurcate horizon so that uh, all observers that were incomplete in the original space-time uh, pass safely to the extension. C0. So, uh, so somehow, uh, not only in exact Kerr, but in small perturbations of Kerr initial data, it's exactly the same phenomenon, that uh, the space-time, its Penrose diagram is bounded by a globally null surface across which uh, the metric is extended. So uh, in any case, corollary of this already, so this would be an open set in the moduli space of initial data for which the predicate of the inextendability statement that uh, strong cosmic censorship wanted in its C0 formulation is false. So a, a corollary of this is already, so corollary, C0 formulation of strong cosmic censorship is false. Okay, and this is a de definitive statement. It is false for the vacuum Einstein equations without any symmetry. Now, again, just like with the uh, spherically symmetric case and the work of Luke and O, uh, it is thought that generically, okay, this boundary still will be singular in a weaker sense. And uh, there are now many methods that have been developed uh, to be able to show that, at least in a neighborhood of Kerr. So in particular, what that would mean is that in a neighborhood of Kerr, some weaker formulations of strong cosmic censorship should be true and should be provable. Now, just remember one thing. To disprove a version of strong cosmic censorship, 
it's sufficient to find one open set in the moduli space of solutions without symmetry, of course, you understand, one truly open set for which the statement is false. To prove a version of strong cosmic censorship, weak cosmic censorship, whatever your favorite thing, then, okay, this is something about the whole moduli space, or generic in the moduli space. So uh, a, a complete proof of some formulation of strong cosmic censorship that may be true it still looks like it is very, very far off. But uh, a complete resolution of the picture in, in a neighborhood of Kerr is now very much within reach. All right, let me end there. Uh, thanks a lot.